Wow, after a year, I'm finally responding to this request and making this video for you guys. If you've been on my channel for a while, I've been making university content and since coming to university, I've been vlogging my experiences and making educational based content along the way. And I think it makes sense for me to do a UCAS personal statement video to you know, further give you guys some advice and support as I went through the process myself back in 2022. I'm aware that the official UCAS deadline for applications is the 31st of January. I think now being December is the perfect time to you know, maximise that support for it to reach as many students as possible. For context, back in 2022, I was looking at what I wanted to study. I applied for biology slash human sciences related courses across University of Oxford, UCL, Durham, Manchester and Exeter. If you look at my channel, my biggest video being my A-level results day video, you can see that A-level results day, even though I did have offers on the table, it wasn't as a smooth process for me and I got rejected by my firm and my insurance. Had to go through clearing and now I'm a second year at Exeter University and I'm absolutely loving it here and it's been the best decision. Just before I go into my personal statement, I think it's important to note that plagiarism is a massive thing that UCAS take seriously. Um, I'd really, really advise do not copy anything word for word. It's simply there for to spark some interests that you may have. You want to take some ideas from it and form it into your own perspective. Uh, UCAS have a really good similarity detector and, and you do not want to be getting flagged up for something like that. It is quite a strict checker. Even though I did get rejected by Oxford after the interview stage, I have heard cases where personal statements have been brought up. It wasn't brought up for me, but it was mentioned and praised in my feedback report. So um, it just goes to show that admissions officers, including Oxford, they do actually look at these statements. I do believe my personal statement had a role in getting me to the interview stage. As well as that, unfortunately, I did get rejected by UCL due to the sheer competition. That was the only reason I got rejected because it was that competitive. And I received an offer from Manchester, Durham and Exeter from my application where the personal statement was a large component of it. You do really want to do your best in this personal statement. Do multiple drafts. Try and make sure that it really reflects who you are as a person because most admissions officers understand that GCSEs are quite old and not an accurate representation of who you are right now. As long as you have at least a four in English and maths, you'll be fine. And A-level predictions, you know, they tend to be quite similar. Uh, references tends to be all positive. And it's really the specific parts of your personal statement that actually does put you apart from other applicants applying for the same course at the same university for the limited places. Without further ado, let's go onto my laptop and get analysing. Here you can see me on my UCAS website. It's crazy to think that this is 2022. If you're here just to see my statement and you want to go off and you know get on with your life, you don't want to hear the advice I've got and me talking through my statement, then here it is. So um, I'll just scroll down and you can take the bits that you need and then as the video goes on, I'll go back and go through it. Feel free to you know, pause at the points where you'd like to read it. And yeah, it's all yours. And you can see when you submit, there's something called a similarity report that gets generated. It says if similarities in your personal statement have been detected, the similarity report section will display a color coded similarity report. If we have not detected similarities in your personal statement, this section will appear blank. So this just confirms this is all my work. Ideally, you know, don't copy my stuff <laughs> just to avoid this issue. To make it easier to analyse, I'm going to shift over to Word now. UCAS Human Sciences Personal Statement, Draft 11. Don't let this scare you. I did 11 drafts in the end because I started editing my personal statement and making it in the summer holidays of year 12. And whenever I got a light bulb moment, I'd go straight into my personal statement on my word document and start making edits. Um, a lot of people only do a couple of drafts, so that's fine. 
And as you can see here, here are my unis I applied for. At Oxford, uh, my main college I applied for was Wadham. And then I was also given a secondary interview at Keeble College. It was a great experience, despite getting rejected. I'm really thankful I had that experience because it's played a part in increasing my confidence now, now that I'm applying for internships and graduate jobs, etc. Let's just go straight into it. So firstly, you'll see that throughout this personal statement, I cover a lot of things. So human sciences is the study of humans as a biological, social and cultural beings. And I try to cover all parts of that as much as I can to show that I was a well-rounded individual with an interest across everything that applies to humans. If you're applying for more specifically biology, like maths or medicine or law, your statements are obviously going to be quite different in that respect. It got to the point where by draft 11 and before me submitting this actually, I would just read through this and I'd just get butterflies. I just feel really happy and really confident and just really excited uh, because I had perfected it that much. So um, that's, a, that's a sign. If you get to the point where you get, get excited through reading your personal statement, you're pretty much there. So, persistently querying a biological explanation for why, the answer usually leads to Darwinism. Greedon's Dawkins, the selfish gene, introduced me to a new gene-centric view of life. The Battle of the Generations was an eye-opening chapter explaining how unconscious exploitation can occur within the family unit, a microanalysis which bears substantially on micro on macro assessments of manipulation behaviours within wider society. Parents occupy a position of power and children a capacity to manipulate through behavioural characteristics of cheating, lying and framing. Wadham College, Oxford University's Human Sciences Access Summer School learnt that evolution could be used as a foundational concept to, to deterministically predict the activities of future mankind. I have a desire to understand the connections between the psychology of attachment and the biology of the human genome. Right. First paragraph, you can see how it's straight to the point. The uh, UCAS is quite strict. I think it's 4,000 characters, which is the limit. You can't go above that, otherwise UCAS cuts it off. So um, you don't want to be wasting time going straight into it. Um, evolution is a big thing in human sciences, so it makes sense to focus on that. Don't start off cliche. Be unique. Have a different way to open up. I mentioned The Selfish Gene, which is a very famous book within the field of evolution. Anyone could just mention a book. So I went to the extent of talking about a chapter, um, The Battle of Generations, which was probably my favourite chapter in the book. Um, and there was a particular page in there that really grasped my attention. And, you know, I went like, oh, quite interesting, interesting point of view there. Uh, I talked about what I learned from that bit and how that could apply to wider society. So you can see here, microanalysis, so the bit in the book, bear substantial macro assessments and manipulation behaviours in wider society. So you try and use what you learn and, and how it can apply to real world things that are happening out there. I had my own interpretation in there as well. So this line here, I talked about a summer school I did over the year 12 summer holiday, which was a great experience, you know, an access summer school uh, where I spent a week on modern college. More information about that in this video and linked below. I then talked about the psychology of attachment. So attachment is one of the modules that was within the psychology A-level syllabus. My favourite one, the biology of the human genome really interests me too, so how those two can interlink. Moving on, I talked about anthropology. I embraced an anthropological view to selfishness through reading Harari Sapiens. Such a great book. If you're interested in anthropology and human history, worth a read. Such a great book and it really simplifies it down. It's really easy to understand. Harari discusses replacement theory. Go in specific. Don't just mention the title of the book. Anyone can do that. Go specific. Which suggests the first most significant case of mass ethnic cleansing by Homo sapiens through the removal of archaic human species, Neanderthals and Denisovans. This just goes to show that I have gone out of my way to actually read the book and study anthropology to at least a basic level. Anthropology is a subject that isn't taught at A level. By showing my knowledge in Neanderthals and Denisovans, which are human species that existed before, before they got extinct, shows that I want to learn more about this. Ethnic cleanse and natural selection have been intrinsically linked in genocide studies. So, you know, again, extrapolating, using what I've learned to try to talk about that further. Notably, those orchestrated by fascistic regimes. Considering how social norms can have a powerful effect on an individual's beliefs, 
Perhaps overriding genetics, teaching children mutual altruism could be an efficient method for the socialization of tolerance and empathy. So here, you can see again, similar to what I did in my first paragraph, you really want to use what you've learned and apply it to real world and the future and how you can create positive change in society. This third paragraph is more about me. I also link it to a third book I read. In terms of books, I'd say keep books at three, maximum of three. Don't just list lots of books. And then I also mentioned a uh, film that I watched as well. It has that academic focus because I was applying for Oxford. So if you're not applying for Oxford, you have a bit more leeway to keep it a bit less academic. That was the main reason why there's all these books, extra reading involved. Identifying as a Bengali Muslim living in Western culture has exposed me to alternative ways of life. My traditionalist family within an ethnically marginalised society has adapted in response to differing social values around us. So I've used my own personal experience of human sciences and how culture sort of clashes and adapts with within people, which I believed was quite an interesting thing to say. I noticed fluctuating con conceptions of morality across all regions of the world. Reading Dorling's Population 10 Billion, again, an amazing book. Demography isn't covered much in A-level. I know there's a bit on sociology, but if you're interested in demography and population, birth rates, death rates, immigration, stuff like that, Population 10 Billion is a great book. Led me to realise the significance of such unwritten laws as a mechanism to prevent a demographic crisis. Dorling adopted a bold internationalist view of liberal migration control, reliant on families' innate concern with familial sustainability to crush a common public misconception of migration being a cause of overpopulation. So again, I specifically researched Dorling as a person and in his book, he made his views really clear and I made that obvious in my personal statement to show I have actually read this book. Nevertheless, a form of borderless, frictionless migration control, as advocated by Dorlin, can appear utopian in the tribal and often populist arena of world politics. So look, I challenged him here. Um, so even though um, his views are great, I don't tend to agree with anything anyone, any academic says. I said, okay, this is what he said, but this could be a counter argument. And I recommend you do the same. This this point um, I'm really proud of. With emerging interest in public health through global news, this was COVID time. You know, I'd naturally be, just like everyone else, I think everyone developed an interest in public health and wanted to know what was going on. And I started to question the influence of governmental laws and policies on a citizen's quality of life. Watching Hypernormalization, such a great film. If you have a chance, watch it. I think it's about a two hour long film on BBC iPlayer, free to watch. Exposed me to troubling ideas around the history of international political deception, systematic corruption, and a broken hierarchy of communal power as a technique to maintain social control. There's just so much to unpack in hypernormalization. It by the time you finish watching the film, you're left in a state confusion. It's so good. As a collective public, we generally prefer to retreat into a simplified and fake version of our world and as a result normalise acts of fraudulent behaviour. Social conformity and tolerance against elitism at individual and group level intrigues me. I mean, even now, I have noticed that this, as well as the other points I've mentioned in my statement so far, I have looked into them further and I've developed a bigger interest in some bits more and, you know, it's opened up more doors of areas where I can build more knowledge on. So um, yeah, these interests that are in you, I mean, everyone's got some, you've definitely got some stuff inside, inside yourself that you want to learn about more. It's about finding it and telling them, this is what I want to learn and going to university to study this will allow me to build on that. Yeah. So this is the one bit that isn't academic. Um, it's more based around what I do outside of academics. Remember, if they know that you're not going to be a robot, you're not just going to be studying all the time. You've got to have a life outside of studying to help in that intense situation. You're a human at the end of the day. Okay, <laughs> I, I know studying human sciences, you cannot just be studying all the time. You have to have hobbies, interests, extracurriculars out there. So um, yeah, I left my last statement. 
arguably the least important because I was applying for Oxford. I said my dedication in sport as a black belt in karate, amateur boxer and county sprinter has taught me resilience and pressured environments. University is a pressured environment and I've showed how my hobbies have helped develop that skill in me. Participating in the Biology Olympiad thrice and completing a Nuffield Research Placement with Education Policy Institute, earning a Gold Crest Award, facilitated critical thinking and rigorous research at an academic level. These two skills, critical thinking, rigorous research, two of the biggest skills that you're going to need at university when you're looking at sources, when you're writing essays, etc. So I've, I've said um, I've already been developing these skills through these placements. Um, and taking part in these things. Volunteering as a biology maths tutor, representing our, our academy as a head boy and managing a study-centred Instagram and YouTube channel, this one, <laughs> has made me realise the value of supporting peers through teamwork and proactive leadership, striving to be the best person I can as an individual and member of the community. But this YouTube channel, the main reason I started it you know, back in 2018, is because it helps others and I get satisfied seeing people develop and improve as people and coming to me for advice. Like, and my DMs are always open. Here's my Instagram, Z underscore IZ1A. Just pop over a DM. I have a reputation for applying quick and always happy to help. It's just a close-in statement, just to top it all off. The interdisciplinary nature of human sciences will allow me to be challenged by different schools of thought. I welcome new ideas, aim to forge links between contemporary issues, and voice opinions that will enable positive growth for humanity. There we go. <laughs> the end. I think that was a nice way to end, and I'm really proud of this. Feel free to go back on it if you want me to have a look at your statement feel free to dm me or leave a comment or get in touch um i'd love to help you out i think it's important to remember that because they're reviewing so many personal statements they're only going to spend a couple of seconds looking at yours which actually replicates how it is in the real world once you're a graduate even like applying for any job like at your stage now as a graduate as a university student your employers will only look at your CV for a couple of seconds and they'll decide, you know what, should I interview this guy? Should I offer him the job or look for someone else? This is like a taster for that. And if there is a candidate that's got the exact same grades as you and the exact same references, looks the same on paper, they'll probably use a personal statement to differentiate which one to give that final place to. You know what I mean? Just a reminder. Do feel free to take ideas from this, but do not plagiarise. It's a big thing, and I've, I've already mentioned it in this video, but it is a big thing, and it is a taster for university. Like my university uses Turnitin, and every time you submit an essay, it generates a similarity report. In the rare cases, if there are students copying work from online, not referencing correctly, going against the academic code of conduct, you can get in trouble for it. So this is basically the first taster of doing your own work and it being checked except from that i hope this has been insightful and i'm happy to answer any questions and help you as much as i can um, and all i can say is good luck don't leave it too last minute <laughs> best to get started now do not leave it till a couple of days before because it it's not worth it all right take care guys till the next one